Tonight we are live on the bottom line. And of course, when we talk about the bottom line, we talk about everything uh, within the fiscal and monetary space of the economy. We talk about businesses, we talk about employment, we talk about inflation, we talk about whatever it is that has to do with the economy of the country, especially amongst um, creation of employment for the youth and so on and so forth. Uh, we are live from our studios here at uh, Ridge in Accra. Tonight, we are coming your way with the Public Procurement Authority in focus. So around 2019, I think in April or so, His Excellency the Vice President, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, led the Public Procurement Authority to launch what they call the GANEBS, which is an electronic procurement system, um, purposefully to take away some of the quote-unquote corruption that was experienced in the system. How far has it come? Um, what have we seen with it so far? Has corruption gone down? Has misappropriation gone down? Has everything that the state agencies, so to speak, were doing, have they gone down or they have gone up? Tonight, we have details of that for you when we are speaking to um, a research that has been made uh, in the very sector that we want to talk about tonight. So, you want to stick and stay with us. It's going to be about data tonight, and it's going to be about questions tonight. My name is Kwesi Efri. We take a quick break. When we are back, we get into our data analysis. Right, you welcome back from the break. This is the bottom line. And I've told you that tonight we are focusing on the Public Procurement Authority. And there are some issues that we have to look into tonight. And um, we are going to focus more on data analysis tonight because the document we are looking at here or we are basing on for our discussions tonight is a research work by Imani Center for Policy Analysis and Education. And uh, they say, of course, it is in collaboration with ISEB, but um, led by Imani Center for Policy Analysis. And the lead consultant is uh, Mr. Denis Asari. We are happy to have him here in the studio tonight. Denis, good evening. Thank you very much for joining us. Good evening. Thank you very much. I hope much, you're doing very well. I'm doing very great yourself. Um, tonight, we are looking at um, the Public Procurement Authority. And if you have studied a bit of a history of the Public Procurement Authority, it was set up during the Estuar President Kofor's um, tenure, when he was president, there needed to be reformation in the way especially state agencies, agencies do their business, um, purchases and supply of goods and services needed to be streamlined. So the Public Procurement Authority was set up and it's gone through the mail. Um, so recently when we heard all the issues about EBA, a J and um, all the things that came up. However, I believe that it has still helped streamline a lot of things within the sector. However, um, a research by Imani Center for Policy Analysis and Education is making some revelations. We don't want to take the wind out of your mouth. Um, what's been happening so far? So thank you very much, Kwesi, and good evening to your viewers. So over the years, we know that public procurement issues have been a legacy problem. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if you go deep down our history, mm -hmm. public procurement was centered around a single agency. So if you look at the Public Works Department, Ghana National Construction Agency, mm -hmm. the Ghana Supply Company, down to even establishing the PPA itself in 2003. So all of that open procurement activities to a lot of political interferences, um, insider manipulation and corruption. Mm -hmm. So the said value for money that we expect to gain from procurement was not achieved. And the reason why procurement is very important is that that is how government's money is spent. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the public financial management system, mm -hmm. at the budget execution stage, if you take out compensation and interest payment, every other item on expenditure list, it's executed through procurement. Mm -hmm. So if we are not getting the said value for money, Therefore, a country's development is a reflection also of the efficiency of your public procurement system. So we've seen that over the years, in spite of all the reforms that we, we have implemented, and let me take us a little back to when we did the public financial management reform program and the country procurement assessment reform, we realized that the public procurement system was a major risk to our public financial um, framework. 
So we sought to implement a lot of reforms. But over the years, after mm -hmm. 20 years of reforming, or since 2003, where we actually did a full-blown reform program, the irregularities in the public procurement activities of MDEs mm -hmm. have not declined. In fact, the Auditor General estimates that in the last 10 years, the procurement irregularities of only MDEs is estimated around 143.7 million Ghana cities. 143.7 million, million Ghana cities. Ghana cities, in spite of the reforms that have come yes. from 2003. And three. Now, if you look at even, so the cost in terms of the financial cost of the irregularities, mm -hmm. this is between 2010 and 2020. Even what is even surprising in the case of public boards and corporation, the Auditor General estimates about 1.04 billion Ghana cities in terms of irregularities. In fact, the 2020 irregularities is estimated to be about 42% of the additional 2 billion Ghana cities spent to contain the COVID-19 pandemic by the Ministry of Health. So, I'll let you go to the screen. I mean, yeah. I am interested in this data that you are giving. Yeah. And uh, before I get you to the screen, yeah. what was the premise for this research? When you get to the screen, we'll come back to um, this data and a bit of the history that you are yeah. giving before you go on to uh, the, whole, the whole research work and you begin to take us through one by one and we ask the uh, pertinent questions. But what was the basis for this research? Okay, so the overarching aim of this work is that we spend averagely about between 10 to 11 percent of our GDP on procurement. Mm -hmm. And over the years, Imani has been interested in investigating how public institutions spend public funds mm -hmm. because the efficiency of spending translates to economic development. Mm -hmm. Now, if we are not seeing efficiency in spending, then mm -hmm. on the other end, we are not going to see development. That's why we've also witnessed some form of worsening welfare. Mm -hmm. Now, we look at historically, how is our procurement system delivering efficiency? Mm -hmm. So what we sought to do is that beyond the political economy issues, because most of the time when you talk about procurement, it appears to center around corruption or who is getting hurt. But by way of policy, our public institutions working with the existing PPE rules. Now, if they are doing that, how are they procuring? What are the underlying drivers of these irregularities despite the reforms that uh, we have implemented over the years? So what we, are, what we sought to do with ASAP is to critically examine our public procurement system, whether it can save the public purse or it is hurting the public purse. Now, if it is hurting the public purse, what are the drivers? Now, if it is saving the public purse, which areas can we improve on? Before you go to, to the screen, from, from yeah. the research you've done, yeah. is it hurting the public purse? So we say that if we continue business as usual, that is, if we do not enforce the then rules. Then it obviously will hurt yes. the public purse. If you continue be, uh, procuring as we are doing and not apply the rules, apply the sanction, enhance internal controls, ensure that the people doing procurement are ethically sound and we have the right institutions in terms of oversight and regulatory to undertake these things, then the current public procurement regime we have will hurt the public purse. Right. So, uh, yeah. Let me ask you my, my very last one. The rest yeah. of it will be with the screen, what was your methodology? I mean, kinds of works yeah. like this yeah. would bring up a lot of questioning, would yeah. bring up a lot of, um, um, I don't want to say doubts, but people mm. beginning to question your style, um, what the aim was and everything. But um, to, to ask you directly, what was the methodology used? Okay, so summarily, what we did was that we looked at the procurement irregularities of mm -hmm. public boards and corporations, other strategic institutions, mm -hmm. ministries, departments, and agencies. Mm -hmm. Now, we track their irregularities in the last 10 years, and the main source document was the Auditor General's report. Okay. After that, okay. we rank the ministries based on your contribution to the overall irregularity. And in the case of the MDEs, we selected 11 MDEs, and these 11 MDEs in the past 10 years, their procurement irregularities contribute about 97% of the total irregularities recorded over the years. So if we critically want to understand... Do, do we have them in the document? Or, yes, they are so all in we'll the report live we'll on, these, our, these, on our website. Yes, yes. I, I, I am interested in yes. knowing, because um, mm. you are a civil society organization. Yeah. You may not be able to go to court eventually. Yeah. If you decide to, you will be able to. But we should be interested in how yeah. um, we, we recover some of these monies yeah. or how punitive measures 
Definitely. are used against some of uh, else the research would come to yes, us if we definitely. don't get it. so definitely. in the worst case we should be able to name and shame mm, yeah. some of these institutions yeah. once you have your document yeah. um intact and you have your research work so kindly end on that and then we'll go to this so then in the case of the public boards and corporations with the mm. same methodology mm. we look at over the last 10 years mm. which institutions have contributed significantly to that and in, the, in that we look at the sector ministries and their public board and corporations. You know, the Auditor General reports the public board and corporations under sector ministries. And out of that, we had about seven ministries that we, we looked at. Now, overall, in terms of the total contracts that beyond the computation of the irregularities, then we look at the procurement transactions or contracts that have been published by these institutions because we wanted to critically understand how are they procuring, which methods are common among these um, MDAs and public boards and corporations. Mm -hmm. So we look at the PPA website as the main source of tracking. So the my PPA next question website. to you yeah. was going to be, what level of collaboration? Because yeah. we know that the PPA, right, as you said, from yeah. 2003 at least, should have a very good database yeah. of, of what's happening with each of these institutions. And once we come to um, the work you've done itself, as regards the e-procurement, GANEPS, when we come into the details of that, GANEPS should have been able to, we know that they have um, trained most of these institutions, they have been yeah. going around and we've heard them and seen them on the news. And they should have a database of mm. what's happening. So I was going to ask you, what's your level of collaboration with them during the research and in your methodology again? Um, uh, did you get data from them? Did you speak to them? Did they give you data? Did they verify some of the things that you have put out that we are going to talk about now? Okay, so Kusi, I'll say that by law in the Procurement Act, public institutions are mandated to publish their procurement activities right. in the PPA bulletin. Right. So even if you don't engage the PPA, you should be able to access all the procurement activities of public institutions, but that is not the case. That's all what the public institutions are doing. Mm -hmm. Now, beyond that, most of them are not published. And they are not in, being punished. Yes, and in, uh, during the presentation, we show you even an example of two institutions that looking at over the years, the numerous procurement activities that they've engaged in, we were, only, we were able to find only one or two contracts under that ministry. Wow. So after the work we did, we extended the invitation to the PPE to also share some of the findings that we have gathered, then the drivers we have identified. But during that period, they were unable to respond within the uh, period, and the work was also to be undertaken within a time frame. But during the stakeholder engagement and report launch, they responded, and a member, that's the head of the monitoring evaluation, was part of our panel, who also provided some very deep insight to the issue. So we have that's a very the head good, of M and E for, for, for PPE. PPE. So we have a very good relationship from after the stakeholder forum and I have you seen your document? Oh yes, they were at the presentation. Have they Yes, so they are the presentation. They made contributions, and where they had to correct certain information, they provided that, and the document has been amended. I'm sure so, we'll come back to that. Yeah, so this after, final after one you see on our website, we have incorporated the feedback we received from the panel discussion as well as the stakeholder engagement, and integrated all of that, refined it, and put it out there. So. Largely, they agree to the issues that we raise as the major source of the drivers of procurement irregularity. So I think that after this work, we, we've established a very good relationship, and going forward, we hope that that relationship will be maintained. Yes, yeah, so we didn't take them out. So how many minutes do I give you to go through your document? Well, um, I would say 15, 20 minutes. We should be able in, to touch in, on in the In 25, issues. we should be done. Yeah, we should be done. Yeah. So, yes, I'm sure you can take up my screen now. Um, okay. If you're watching us, we are talking about... Um, the Public Procurement Authority tonight. And uh, Mr. Dennis is, is the lead consultant of the research that's been done. Um, we are going to have him uh, be on the task screen to give us an analysis of the research work that they've done. And um, the topic that he's discussing tonight is, is Ghana's public procurement system hurting or saving the public pairs? And that's what I'm uh, getting him to be doing for us. So you see him walk across our stage to the screen. If it's ready, that's um, the document. The document uh, or the research work was done by Imani Center for Policy Analysis and Education and Africa Center for Energy Policy. So Dennis, if you're ready, um, the floor is yours now. Thank you very much, Kwesi. So the first question that we ask is that why should um, citizens be interested in public procurement? So if you look at our public financial management system, mm. public procurement is the stage where the budget that is presented and the expenditure items 
this is where it is executed. Right. So if you take out the compensation and interest a payment, mm -hmm. all other expenditure items in the budget are spent or executed through procurement. So then it means the efficiency of your procurement system would influence how well the budget plans or the business proposals of the government are achieved. Okay. Now, historically, procurement has been identified as a critical financial risk in our public um, financial management system. Mm -hmm. If you look at the days of the public financial management reform program, as well as the country procurement assessment review. Mm -hmm. So as a country, we decided to implement some reforms to address the lapses in our procurement system. Right. So in the last 10 years, we've seen a lot of reforms. In fact, in 2016, we amended the law that we, um, we uh, implemented in 2003 to integrate more stronger oversight and responsibilities to the institutions. Under the World Bank e-transform project, that was about $97 million. $4 million was dedicated to building an electronic procurement system. And the aim is that procurement was done manually. And if you consistently, uh, consistently do it manually, it opens um, the procurement process up for insider manipulation, corruption. And we see that deep down in our history, most of the corruption cases you've seen in, in this country have been linked to what public procurement. You've seen the Buzz Branding exercise, mm, mm, the recently won mm. by the um, former uh, PPA boss. Mm, All mm. of that attests to mm. some weaknesses or fragilities within the procurement system. At the moment, we have about 430 public institutions on the GANEPS, and about 330 has, uh, have been trained. But in spite of all uh, these reforms... How yeah, many of them are we expecting to get on board? So we, the local government ministry, if you check the number of public institutions we have in Ghana, they are over 600. And, and they the, have enrolled 430. Yes, enrolled 430, but technically training has been given to about 330 all right. on how to use um, the GANEPS. Right. But Auditor General estimates that in spite of the reforms and um, programs that we've implemented to uh, improve our procurement system, the irregularities of public institutions have increased over the period. In the case of MDAs, the total irregularities that we recorded in the last 10 years was about 143 million Ghana cities. In the case of public boards and corporation, it was a, a little over a billion. So this is a trend of the procurement irregularities of MDAs and public boards and corporation. And what is very important is that years before and after election years, we tend to record higher procurement irregularities. Mm -hmm. And the years before is because in most cases, governments tend to implement a majority of their manifesto promises during this period. Right. And the challenge we have with our public institution is that their procurement systems are not always reconfigured to understand how to implement these new manifesto promises mm -hmm. that comes from political parties. So for example, if there's planting for food and jobs, to what extent was the procurement system of the ministry readjusted to suit the goals of the planning for food and jobs program? So where the right adjustments are not done, we expect some irregularities. Some of them too were deliberate abuse of the procurement law, such as not seeking the PPS approval this, in single source. This is the time to chop money. Whilst we are going into elections, this is the time to make, make money. Well, in terms of the political economy side, it's true because there are some clear cases where corruption has been cited, conflict of interest and other issues have been cited. So you can say that these are the periods where government pumped a lot of money into their manifesto promise. Or I mean, you are yet to go into it, but these yeah. are also the times that they didn't get approval mostly um, from the PPA. So if you look at the Auditor General's report on procurement irregularities, eight out of 10 cases public institutions did not comply with the law. And majority and nothing of them, happened to them. And nothing happened to them. Majority of, of them too were related to single sourcing and restricted tendering, where please they did not seek please, approval. Please go ahead. Now, the trend is even much clearer. And let me say that all of these data have been adjusted to inflation. So the effect of inflation on these values have been corrected. Mm -hmm. You see that in the case of public boards and corporation, we see a sudden rise in 2012, it declines, then 2016, it rises again and rises very sharply in 2020. 2020, we can say that because of COVID, certain rules were relaxed for government to quickly procure the, uh, the, the goods and services needed to address the pandemic. But generally, what you see is that our public procurement irregularity trend has not declined over the period, although we saw some significant decline in 2018. And let me say that this was a period where the PPA implemented a due diligence unit and other reform programs, particularly the GANEPS, was highly implemented within this period. But we see what is striking is that 
the procurement irregularities between 2016 and 2020 is about 150, or in the case of MDs, it's about 115 million Ghana cities out of the 143. So a period where we have amended our procurement law, we have implemented a lot of reforms. This is the period where we are recording a lot of irregularities. So you say that yeah. from 2010 yes. to 2020, yes. irregularities of MDAs, of MDAs yeah. amount to 143.7 million. million. Yes. And within the last four years, last or five four years, years, alone, yes. alone, has 115 million. Yes, about 115 million. So that is why it raises a lot of questions about whether these reforms we are implementing are actually being implemented effectively at the MDS level. This is amazing because yeah. if you are a supplier for, for any government institution, yes. first of all, you need to register with the Public Procurement Authority. That's some of the new reforms you've brought in. You need yes. to have a certificate. Yes. And that certificate covers you even if you are not registered with mm -hmm. the institution. Mm -hmm. So how so that even within this period, we have this amount of money going so, off of the mill? You see, largely, it's because of non-compliance with the public procurement law Please and lack on. of enforcement. Please box on. Now, so the main aim of Imani and ASEP was to critically examine how public institutions were procuring. And the main drivers of these irregularities, if we have consistently implemented a lot of reforms in, term, uh, by, uh, in terms of the legal framework and even implemented a technology platform, then we, sh we should see it translating into mm -hmm. efficiency. Mm -hmm. So the methodology, as I already explained, so I wouldn't yeah. want to go back no there problem. again. No so problem. what we did was that if you take the MDAs, the 11 MDAs that we use as a case study, we track their procurement transactions or contracts on the PPA website. Mm -hmm. Now, when we do that, we are looking for two main things. What method are these institutions using to procure? Then what is the financial value of the method that they have chosen? So if you see... In the case of the MDEs, out of about 330 um, tr uh, transactions, you find that largely open competitive tender dominates as the main method. So you would say that then clearly, okay, there's some sort of comp competition in the procurement of MDEs. But what will even strike you is that in terms of the financial value of the transaction, you see that a lot of the money went into single sourcing. Wow. So the total value, financial value of the 120 single source contract is about 18.7 billion out of the 19.9 billion of the total procurement of the 330 transactions of MDAs that um, we were able to identify. Which means that although the main method or the common method is open tender, the financial value of single sourcing transactions are about 18 times the financial value of open competitive tender. And this is a problem because single sourcing and restricted tender are supposed to be used for goods that come at a premium or they are little, little suppliers. So if we are not being competitive in identifying how we can play effectively in this market, then what it means is that we are going to deal with suppliers who are going to take advantages of the uh, weaknesses uh, in the uh, system. This, this, this was that issue. is the shocking thing because- It's, it's very shocking. This yes. was an issue in the run up to the 2016 elections. Yes. I remember So clearly. we see that largely- Last branding, so, so, we Good. popularly called so sourcing. So, sourcing. so largely public institutions are more likely to use single source and restricted tender for high financial value transactions than open competitive how so? tender. How, how, is it, how does that happen? Yes. How but does that go through the PPE? Technically, yes. it has to go through the PPE. Every single source and restricted tender must be approved by the PPE. So this is one of the problems that we are raising, that if public institutions are consistently pumping money through this dimension, then we should understand the reasons why this method is being the main preferred one for high financial value transactions. Mm -hmm. When we get there, it will strike you that most of the MDAs and public boards and corporations are not given any justification. In the case of the public, uh, public boards and corporations, we see the same scenario. We're able to identify over 832 um, contracts. And out of that, more than half was transacted through open tender. But if you look at the financial value, you see that restricted tender is in the lead. We have the financial value of restricted tender contract is two times the financial value of open competitive open tender. tender. So it appears that most public institutions we have in this country are more likely to use single source and restricted tender contracts for a high financial value um, activities or transactions. Mm -hmm. Now, one, one major challenge that we identify as part of this work is that most public institutions are not disclosing their procurement activities. And you see, that is a problem because as citizens, civil society, and other uh, demand-side accountability actors, we are supposed to know how public institutions are spending our monies. 
And once we know how they are spending our monies, then we can hold them accountable. But if they don't disclose to the PPA how they are spending our money, then it means that we can't hold them accountable. What it also means is that most of the public institutions feel no sense of accountability to citizens. For example, if you take the um, Ministry of Justice and Attorney General, as at the last time in March and April that we checked the PPA website, we were able to identify only one procurement transaction published. Meanwhile, there are procurements going there on are, every day. Procurement going on every, as long as budgetary appropriations and allocations are made to the ministry, it means that procurement is happening. Because your budget, bu budgetary preparation allocation is based on all your procurement plans. In the case of the Ministry of Interior, we're able to find two. So which means is that if as a citizen, Kwesi wants to hold the Ministry of Interior accountable for how they spend public money, Kwesi is unable to do that. And when you are unable to do that, what happens is that when there is the profligate spending, mm -hmm. how do we even prosecute? Mm -hmm. How do you as a citizen mm -hmm. get that adequate data mm -hmm. to do the prosecution or in terms of accountability work that you are supposed to do? Mm -hmm. And that is one of the reasons why we've seen some relatively higher levels of corruption, insider manipulation in the public procurement system because the extent of transparency and accountability is very, very low. Very, very low. And we give this empirical information that if you would want to know how the last 10 years the Ministry of Interior has spent your money, you wouldn't find it on the PPA website. And unless you go and look for the Auditor General's reports year on year. And the challenge with the Auditor General's report is that it gives you the sum of irregularities, but it doesn't give the you the transactions of... that are linked to these irregularities. So that's one major problem we found as part of this analysis. You see, this is interesting because the law says, anytime you use single source and research tender, provide a justification because the circumstances under which you are using this method should meet the requirements uh, of the law. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at, in the case of public boards and corporation, the single sourcing and research tender contract that we were able to identify, majority of the cases, there were no justification. So we cannot prove whether the circumstances under which they use this method merited or was in, in line with the law. And if you look at the Auditor General's report in the last 10 years, most of the irregularities are linked to what non-compliance, and the key non-compliance is not seeking the PPA's approval in using single sourcing. Wow. Another high um, reason that they normally give is proprietary, and because in most cases we assume that because single sourcing uh, method is used for goods, service, and works, where the number of suppliers are few, you would expect that largely this would be proprietary products. So in case of using proprietary and agency, that is also quite interesting. But one issue that was striking to us is that we, we saw that research policy and development were the least reasons used for procurement, which also um, corroborate this issue of how research staff we are as a country. So if public institutions are procuring through non-competitive means, and the least reason driving them is research and policy, that is also a problem. Because one of the requirements or the aim of the procurement law is to promote development through public procurement. So if that is not the main driving force, then it, it raises a lot of questions whether we will be able to achieve that target. We see a similar trend in the case of the MDs. Largely, no reason is given. So it, it is very difficult for citizens in this country to hold MDs accountable as to how they are spending public funds through public procurement. But this, is, this is very serious. Very, very, very striking. And very, very serious. looking at how government wants to revitalize the economy, if you look at the financial value of the Obatampa Cares Program, mm -hmm. about 100 billion yes. Ghana cities. Mm -hmm. The effectiveness and efficiency of that program depends on the nature of the procurement underlying it. Because all of them are going to be programs that you have to procure good services and works right. to undertake it. Right. So if we don't have a very robust and transparent procurement system, then the aim of the Obatampa Cares Program, I'm sorry, we may implement we it, it, but we are going to miss it. Now, to make it even the cases very clear, we picked the case study of some few agencies to show you how clearly some public institutions are not complying with the PPA law. So let's start with the case of BOSS. So in 2015, BOSS awarded a contract to Rolida Company for the construction of its head office co complex. Now, when you look at the report by the Auditor General on that's, its assessment. That's 39 million dollars. That's 39 million dollars for the construction of its head office. That, and these are all found in the Auditor General's report. Mm -hmm. Now, according to the report by the Auditor General, but the, the uh, boss did not seek approval from the PPA before awarding this contract. So, and we verified that looking at the time they went to seek approval and the time the contract was awarded, the contract was awarded in June, but the approval was sought in December. Clearly, 
a blatant abuse of the law. Contract was awarded in Con June. Yes, the contract was awarded in June 2015. June 2015. 15, but the approval was From sought. PTA. Yes, approval was sought in December. So all the details, whether whether the money should be approved yes, or not, or how not. much the so BOQs that were God, given and everything. Yes, you remember have recently. Been agreed on. Yeah, recently the Minister of Finance mentioned how public institutions are committing government to contracts that they may not be giving funds to pay for. Right. And this is how they happen. People sign contracts before seeking approval, and this is clearly in the Auditor General's report. Now, what happened even in this case is that when the P uh, boss awarded the contract, it was through single sourcing. But when they sought approval, the PPA even recommended restricted tender by listing some companies that they should engage, which means that if they had sought the approval of PPA before, perhaps the final financial would value obviously have would have been lower. So that is the case you are making that beyond looking at the PPE, what are heads of entities, the entity tender committees, and the uh, uh, department agents and ministries doing, the way they are procuring, would always lead to some financial how, how irregularities. How for... award the contract before going to PPE? Yes, so once their procurement plans are approved and published, and they start procuring, and even when they adjust their plans, until they come to seek approval, or there's an auditor general as Auditor General's report, mm -hmm. it is very hard for the PPA to know because they are, most of them are not using the GANEPs, especially those who are on it. Because once you use the GANEPs... They don't list those yes, contracts. Yes, the they moment you award it, it trickles down to the contract. So the PPA will even see it before and, and approve it. Another challenge is that we try to look... The law says entities must publish their procurement activities in the bulletin. We try to look for this transaction in the bulletin and we couldn't find a transaction. And there's the evidence for it. You couldn't find a transaction. So by, by, by the PPA law, this transaction by BOST blatantly abused the law. And as of now, there's been no publicly available report as, about the sanctions method to the officers involved. And nobody and, has been even called to, to, to be questioned. Nothing. And if you try to look for the Public Accounts Committee's report to see the responses given, we're able to identify only one report. That is the report for 2017-2018. So we can't confirm whether some sanctions were meted to the officers involved. And you ask a very important question as to how does this happen? It's because the internal control systems mm -hmm. have broken down in the MDAs. So the internal auditors in the uh, MDAs Yes, are, yes, that's the question I was going to come All internal, yes, all, all MDAs all, are all internal, internal auditors. auditors. And the challenge Who is do that... pre audits? Good. So looking at the current system, they all operate through the GIFMIS. Mm -hmm. But the internal auditors have only read, uh, they have read only access to the gift miss. So they can't stop a transaction when it's suspicious. So they can see that BOST is procuring, but they can't stop BOST. So that's the challenge we have. The internal auditors, who are supposed to quality assure the process, do not have influence over the system that is being used to procure. Again, the entity tender committee itself, the internal auditors are not part. So these things happen at the blind side of the internal auditor. So if there's no there internal auditor... There are still documents that will go through, through them for, yes. for signatures and so on and so forth. So what they do is quality assure and write reports about the procurement and other financial transactions of the MDs. But if they are not part of the procurement activities, they are always going to do a post-only analysis. Now we look at the case of Ghana Maritime Authority. So if you look at Schedule 5 of the PPA law, it gives a threshold for which a method can be used. So request for quotation can be used in, in the case of goods when um, it, it exceeds 200,000, you can't use request for quotation. You should use national competitive tender in the case of works and goods. So we look at these two cases and realize that 1.3 million transactions undertaken by the Ghana Maritime Authority, they use the wrong method. And this was covered in the Auditor General's report. So the law requires that if it exceeds 200,000, you should use national competitive tender. But in that case, they use request for quotation. In the case of goods, if it exceeds 100,000, use what um, national competitive tender, but they use request for quotation. But now, I, when I, you I, use I, the I, wrong I, method, mm -hmm. we lose money because the standard of competition that will bring the price value down. We are not going to get that. I am saddled because yeah. all of these entities, Ghana mm -hmm. Maritime Authority, yeah. has a procurement manager. Good. The sad thing is that the procurement officers in our uh, public institutions are powerless. They are not part of decision making. So the last slide we are going to show you, if you see the organizational structure of the entity tender committees, they are only secretaries to the committee. Hold on, let me go for a quick break. I'll, I'll come back to the same point. Okay. Because if, if you are an officer in charge of what is supposed to happen, yeah. it's going through your office. You are supposed to be the man. Yes. Well, yes, there is the head of the, the, the entity yeah. who is a final, uh, so to speak, for want of better, is yeah. a procurement 
uh, manager. Mm -hmm. However, you are the person making sure the documents are right, everything is ongoing. You are the yeah. person who is supposed to advise yeah. the head of entity that this needs to go to the PPA. Mm -hmm. This needs to go through maybe restrictive tendering yeah. or it has yeah. to be an open tender. Yeah, that's true. Let me go on a quick break. I'll come back. Well, so if you just tune in, that's, that's the bottom line. We say business uh, at the speed of thought. But um, we, are, we are discussing not, not the entity public procurement authority, but the infractions which go on uh, within the public agencies. And uh, this is very revealing. Some of the, 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 the items we are seeing here and some of the monies we are seeing here. Um, Denise is our consultant tonight going through a research that's been done by Imani and Ace. But I'll read, um, I think, one or two comments and I'll come back to you. I need to make sure you're able to finish this presentation. And I'm sure we'll bring you back to the studio. This one says, um, good evening to you. We lack a proper regulatory system to monitor a public procurement procedure, which is causing financial loss to the state. I think the government must have a separate legal entity to solely look into our procurement process to avoid a high level of corruption in the public sector. Aaron Babako Kokomisa from Latte Biokoshi sent in this one. Let me pick this one and then I'll come to you, Dennis. Who is responsible for monitoring and auditing these institutions and what do such people do to avoid these infractions? Emmanuel Kwame Denu from Peki sent in that one. Our, our phone number, that's for only WhatsApp or um, SMS. It's scrolling on the screen. You can put up your comments or send a message or concern um, on the phone number. We'll try as much as possible to read it. Let me come back to you, yeah. um, Denise. So what we try to demonstrate is that clearly people are abusing the law. And if you read Auditor General's report, there were no publicly available sanctions that we could identify as part of this work. So it means that the officers who abuse the law, if they have not been sanctioned, you end up reinforcing them or enhancing the ability to abuse the law mm -hmm. and not face any sanction. Mm -hmm. Another case that we looked at was the case of the Ghana Ports and Harbor Authority. So in the Auditor General's report, they, they recorded that between 2017 and 2019, they also engaged in nine different transactions using single sourcing without seeking approval from the PP. And this is clear in the Auditor General's report. 2018, 2019. Between 2017 and 2019. 2017, 2019. 2019. And they, 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 they undertook all of these transactions. And the law says, before you use a non-competitive method, that is single sourcing and share tender, you should seek approval from the PP. All of these transactions occurred, but there were no evidence at the time of the uh, uh, Ghana Audit Service Assessment. There were no approvals from the PP, which means that the PPA, some transactions are happening at the blind side of the PPA. And that is at the institutional level. So if the external scrutiny, that is the last leg of our PFM, is not enhanced to uncover most of these things, a lot of these things will happen without the approval or the transactions. Government will already be committed before the approval is sought. And when that happens, that is at the last stage. And that's why we've seen the case of contract breaches, mm -hmm. or in the case in the past, we used to record a lot of judgment debt because people have already uh, committed government to a transaction, but there may be no funds yes, for we, government to undertake that. Why don't we have them being charged? Yes, and that is the last phase bone we are going to show you. Phase bone. Now, another problem we also identified was the case of contract management. So there are times we find that we buy certain things that are not used and they get wasted in the stores. Another issue too we also identified was that sometimes some contracts are procured, but no work is done. And we found a case of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, particularly the Riyadh mission. A contract of about $60,000 was awarded to Glencoe Construction and Engineering Services in 2017. Now, according to the Auditor General's report, the company was registered after the contract was awarded to it. Wow. So the company was registered on the 7th of January, but the company received a contract on the 3rd of January, 2017. So this is a clear breach of the Public Procurement Act. Another case is the case of the um, Controlling Accountants General uh, procuring value books for the MBAs to record their financial transaction. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we've seen that consistently. They procure these books, they are not used, 
and they go waste in the stores. And in fact, the Auditor General estimates that the amount of unused books of about, cost about 21.5 million Ghana cities. And the financial cost of the procurement losses that we have incurred because books have been procured, but the MDAs are not using it and they have been wasted in the stores was about $39.4 million. That's a million Ghana cities. Yeah, million Ghana cities. And we are still buying those books. And one problem is that there is no collaboration or the collaboration between the CAGD and the ministries is not that strong. So they procure things for them that they don't need or the value books that they are using at the moment is not in line with what is being procured. So we, are, we waste money to buy things that are not used and they are all being wasted in the stores. And all of these are captured in the Auditor General's report. Now, this is very important because the political economy around public procurement also has an influence on its efficiency. Mm -hmm. And because procurement involves a lot of money, you would expect more scrutiny, transparency, and accountability, and some sort of independence. But if you look at the core influence dynamics in terms of how power is distributed within the procurement system, there is excessive influence of the executive arm of government over the entire public procurement system. Now, if you look at the board of the PPA is appointed by the president. The chief executive officer of the PPA is appointed by the president. Mm -hmm. The heads of entity largely are appointed by the president. Exactly. And if you look at the composition of the entity tender committees, these are sort of the quality control institutions we have. Mm. About six out of the nine members are all public servants. So the extent of accountability and responsibility you would want to see in the public procurement system, you can not find that because of the excessive influence of the political class in procurement. And recently, we've seen a lot of politicians publicly speaking about how government should even award contract to party fees force. And that is a clear risk. If politicians do not see conflict of interest as a problem, then that is a danger. And there is a problem. Yes. Another issue is that you mentioned why the procurement officers and the entity tender committees are not able to address some of these problems. So mm -hmm. this is where the head of procurement sits, if you look at the organogram. Yes. These are the key members of the ATC. Mm -hmm. The entity tender committee approves, or in terms of look at whether the procurement activities are in compliance with the law. Now, if you look at the composition of the ETC, the only external members is the two members of professional groups. All yes. of these people are part of the institutions or are public servants, which means that how do you expect the same people who um, ill reports are found about their procurement to hold themselves accountable? So that is why the ETC has, is there, but it's not being efficient. Their composition doesn't let them, because if you want to see accountability, then there, there should be some relatively high independence in the work that they do. Let me just take you back. So if you diagnose the public procurement system, this is how the problems look like. There is a clear lack of enforcement. The sanctions that Section 92, exactly. the that's, sanctions that's the in the PPA law are not being applied. Mm -hmm. And the reasons why the sanctions are not being applied is that the attorney general who has the mandate to prosecute is part of the executive arm of government. So his commitment is divided. So the attorney general cannot hold um, a public institution who its rep is part of the ETC accountable, cannot prosecute a transaction that a rep from the attorney general was part of the ETC. Another challenge is that the OSP2 over the years since its establishment have not shown significant interest in public procurement, section the Office of the I think, Prosecutor. Yes, I think Section 3 of the OSP Act uh, requires it to investigate into corruption, uh, corruption related cases that, mm -hmm. are, that surround public procurement. Another problem we, ha we have to see is that there's a weak internal audit system. So the internal auditors in these public institutions do not have control over procurement. They are powerless. Mm -hmm. And when transactions are going through, currently there's something called procure to pay on the gift miss. So you can procure through the gift miss and pay. The internal auditors can just see it, but they can't stop anything. So what they do is firefighting. They go in to report after the incidents have occurred. So if there's an abuse, they can only record abuse, but they can't right. stop it. Another challenge is that in terms of regulatory oversight, there's some sort of a challenge. One of the problems with our procurement historically was that we centered it around a single agency. And after the reforms, that appear not to have changed. Because if you look at if all single sourcing and re um, research tender must be approved by the PPE, then it creates some sort of a problem. Because then you are centering non-competitive procurement around an institution who in the core influence dynamics, we have shown you that there's an excessive influence of the political class. I agree. So then the extent of accountability and transparency you want to see, you may not be able to um, get it. Another challenge is that the gunnaps that we have at least the last time the head of IT did a presentation, they mentioned that about 76% of the 330 institutions on the GANEPS were not using the platform. 
And the last time we checked during the study in March and April, we were able to identify just about 100 contracts on the platform that is published. So if public institutions are not incentivized, and one of the things we blame the PPA is that if you want them to use it and they are procuring manually, why don't you direct particularly the procurement activities you control all of that through the GANEFs? Because you have spent money to provide technical training. Then there should be some test or trial by this MDS. System. Yes. Then there's also weak safeguard system, and that is clearly seen in the ETC that I demonstrated. Mm -hmm. Another challenge we see we have is that there's, an, there's a clear lack of standards and professionalism in our procurement system. You see, in the financial sector, we have the ACCA, the ICA, try to regularize the behavior of members. But when it comes to procurement, the fundamental question is, how do people get into procurement? What standards are they working with? Because at the moment, we do not have any recognized institution providing certificates or qualification and also ethics standards. So we can say that largely, most of the procurement officers we find in these MDAs are working against no standards or external um, supervision. So when they even violate the law, who is holding them accountable? Recently, you know, the case of ABAJ, the Chartered Institute of Procurement and Supply sanctioned him because he was, he was a member of CIPS. So when we lack this in our procurement practice, then it raises questions about the people factor, and we need people who are ethically sound to manage public procurement in wow. this country. So these are the plenitude of issues facing what um, the public procurement sector, and that is the reason why we are unable to see the value for money. So Chrissy, concluding- Your conclusion. Unfortunately, oh, yeah. our time is even up. We so say we that can if we continue quickly. business as usual, mm -hmm. we wouldn't be able to what, make or achieve the value for money we want. That is because the whole political system in terms of the regulatory oversight is compromised. So what we recommend is that let's ensure that the GANEPS is effectively Effective. used. Then there's currently, there's work between the PP and Ministry of Finance to link the GIFMIS and the GANEPS. So mm -hmm. whatever is happening on the GANEPS can be seen on the GIFMIS. Right. So we, 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 are, we are also encouraging them to facilitate this. Another issue is that the Office of the Special Prosecutor must take significant interest in procurement issues. Recently, PAC um, transferred some cases to the Ghana police. We mm -hmm. say that the law permit OSP to investigate it. So if the Public Accounts Committee think that there's some corruption incidents within the activities they have reviewed, they should just send it toward the OSP for the OSP to critically look at it. So if we're able to implement some of these reforms and the ones in the main report, which you can find on Imani's website and ASAP website, right. we will see some value for money from our public procurement system. Right. Thank so, you very much, Wisin. Thank you very much, um, Dennis. Um, I am overwhelmed. Yeah. Let, me be, let me be very honest. I am I'm very much overwhelmed. Then I have a number of questions. Yeah. I have written here. Unfortunately, our time is up, but I'm happy you've been able to do justice to the presentation. If we get time again, or if you would allow us to meet you again, we'll now go into the details of, probably if we get to here and the PPA here, go into the details one by one and get answers. And maybe if we get some of the procurement officers or managers of some of these institutions, we'll go into it as well. Let me see if I can read just one or two quest, um, 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 text messages and then I am out of here. It says, one says, um, good evening, Leonard from Palladium. What I have observed is that though we are introducing systems, people don't want the systems to work. These sets of institutions are largely appointed by the government. The, these infractions we see in public procurement does not just happen. Government is aware. That is why we don't see people behind bars. Um, you didn't mention, okay, Leonard, your name is here. Hi, it's good we have a conversation about corruption in this country, but we have fail to assess how well some p of these public institutions, MDAs, are paid. Are they well paid to avoid trying to find ways and means to survive through corruption acts? Ebo in Ofanko, unfortunately, I'm not able to complete your message. Um, that's, that's about it. Thank you all very much for watching. Thank you very much. Denis Asari is the head of research or a research consultant at the Money Center for Policy and Education.